Hello and welcome to New Jersey Politics with Laura Jones. I'm Laura Jones and we are so glad to have you here. Summertime has many of us thinking about hitting the shore and maybe enjoying the cool waves of the ocean. One lawmaker in Trenton is standing by and he's here to talk about those waves and the energy the ocean can produce to benefit the environment. Assemblyman Robert Karabinchak is standing by. First, though, we welcome a new legislator to the show to talk about school safety. Assemblywoman Kim Ulner joins us. She is a Republican, Republican representing the 11th Legislative District, which covers parts of Monmouth County. Recently, she moved to force a vote on her bill to standardize school emergency response training for police two days following the apparent missteps of law enforcement during the school shooting in Texas. Let's watch what happened on the assembly floor in Trenton. I would like to talk about too often we grieve the unnecessary tragedy and the parents, families, and communities. But it's not a bill on the on the list. It's not a bill. Sir, on the I respectfully ask that I can speak regarding this bill, A three hundred three. No. It's not a. It's not a bill. You want to make a motion on a bill? Or I'd like something. to make. I'd like to make a motion. Okay. What would be your motion? Thank you, sir. Well, I would like Bill A three hundred three to be an emergency bill. So you'd like to have Assembly Bill A-303 to be declared an emergency? Correct. Okay. The bill Assemblyman, Assemblyman McKeon, why do you rise? Mr. Speaker, uh, in the capacity of uh, parliamentarian, uh, I believe that uh, Rule 15 dash, or colon 11A allows for a bill to go from second reading to third and final reading by emergency. The bill is currently referenced to committee and not on second reading. As such, uh, Mr. Speaker, it's my view that this motion is out of order. Assemblywoman Ulner, is the, is the bill on second reading? No, it is not, but I'm asking okay. for you. In that case, Assemblywoman, I'm going gonna, gonna to rule on, uh, then I'm going like to you declare your through. motion to be out of order. I would, sir, I would like to read I've already declared your motion to be out of order. Assemblyman Assemblywoman Ullman, please take your seat. Out. Cut off her microphone. Okay. Assemblywoman, it's so good to see you here. Thank you, Laura. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, let's talk a little bit about you initially had a motion to procedurally move this forward from a second reading, but you say you were silenced by Assemblyman John McKeon and Speaker Craig Coughlin, um, who they have the authority to put the bill directly on a second reading for the purpose for an emergency floor vote. So what happened? Well, I was um, given permission to speak, I stood up, I uh, announced myself and proceeded to talk about Bill 303, Assembly Bill uh, 303. I was shut down pretty much immediately. Then they gave me a second time to be able to speak again. Um, I didn't get ver very far into my talking points. Um, Assemblyman McKeon suggested I stop and Leader Coughlin suggested I stop speaking and I kept going on. I was just trying to be a little forceful. My family who watched the recording saw that I was sort of banging my hand on the desk so they knew how passionate I was about the subject. Um, and then my microphone was shut off. Um, I know emergencies are requested you know, throughout the assembly and I was shut down without being able to speak. Right. Now, I, I, when you're in uh, going through legislative process, you know, there are certain procedures and uh, amounts of time that you can talk. But what was the message? What message were you trying to communicate? Did they have a problem with your message or was it the procedure? I think it was a little bit of both. Um, as a freshman legislator, I will admit, and I have, um, that the steps I took, I might have stumbled over a little bit. Again, freshman, but I'm you know, mastering those. Um, but it was also my talking points. I felt like no one was listening to me. I spoke as a mother and as a legislator, and one of how I ran was that I'm a, a mother of common sense, and it doesn't matter what party we're in. This is about children's safety, and I was just disheartened when they shut me down. It seemed like no one was listening at all. Yeah, well, tell us a little bit about your legislation, because when when tragedies happen, uh, I've said it before, you, you get often some of the extremes talking about what people disagree on, mm -hmm. as opposed to what can we agree upon and how do we keep our children safe? How do we prevent things like this from happening? So can you tell us a little bit about your bill? Yes, this bill was written actually right after Sandy Hook, 
over 10 years ago. So the fact of the matter is that it's been laying, you know, collecting dust for 10 years, and we've had so many more school shootings since that time. Um, it just, again, was is disheartened me. Being, again, a freshman, uh, I was asked to revitalize this bill, and then I was asked, you know, to speak on it, and no one listened. And I say to many people, again, since I was sworn in in January of this year, we're losing sight of the ultimate goal, protecting our children. Oh, it shouldn't be partisanship. I feel that as a Republican, we're not listened to. It's very disconcerting to look across the floor and everyone's on their phones, not paying attention, and then just immediately vote against any of the bills that could make it to the list uh, from the Republican Party. Yeah. Um, well, so you are you are new. Uh, to the legislature. Um, so l let me just really, you know, quickly ask, you know, people want to see new faces. They want to find people who are not career lawmakers. Mm -hmm. um, they want people, you know, uh, to, to give that perspective. Uh, how have you feel like you've been welcomed overall? I've been welcomed with open arms by all of the Republicans from our leadership, um, even from our, our county leadership, all of our constituents. And there are many Democrats, uh, the people that I've met, obviously, on different committees that I'm on. They've been very welcoming, willing to have conversations. Um, I work very closely with my fellow LD11 Assemblywoman, Marilyn Paperno, also a Republican. And you know, we have a great working relationship. And we feel like being on five different committees, we've really spread out the word of you know who we are and how we want to help and learn. Yeah. And there's a definite learning curve, obviously. Um, but it's everyone's been very wonderful and welcoming. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. There, there are certain policy procedure uh, that that do take a while to to uh, get your legislative legs, so to speak. Uh, but some of the legislation you're behind, you know, again, when when you look at a shooting, whether it's in Texas or uh, some of the other areas, uh, grocery stores and such, mm -hmm. um, mental health often is is an issue that people tend to agree. Uh, upon that it is a factor and people we need resources to address that to prevent and so can you talk a little bit about some of the legislation you're behind that supports just that yes well just to point out that may is considered mental health awareness month which in the legislature we recognized so the fact that now it's june i don't want that just to be that one month that we pay attention to it um, some legislation that we have uh, pending are to help training teachers to look for certain signs of suicide. Uh, in our district office, we've met with many people since we've been sworn in. Um, one was the teen suicide awareness group. So statistics have shown that um, emergency room visits are up over 50% for teens. So what we wanna do is again, bring awareness to the teachers, anybody that is in a child's life to look for certain um, ways, things to look for to prevent this. Um, if you see someone maybe becoming isolated, uh, maybe you know hanging out with different people, maybe starting substance abuse, um, those are all signs. So if we sort of get the stigma out of mental health and let people be able to raise their hands and be like, you know what, I'm really scared, I'm really alone, I'm feeling depressed, um, I think that's important. Um, okay. So there are some bills that we are hoping that will pass um, related to all of those issues. Right. I mean, your school, you know, used to be where you learned reading, writing, arithmetic. Now students uh, regularly are running drills on what to do if there's an active school shooter. So how are you hoping that some of this legislation ultimately improves safety for New Jersey school students and for, for, for all of us? Okay. The one bill, A303, was to put into standardized training for all police and first responders throughout New Jersey. As we saw in Texas, and I know some of the in initial information was has been since uh, disputed, but we need to have a standard response for, by everybody. The fact that we don't need parents standing aside and trying to break into school themselves. Um, we also want to have all of the teachers and the students trained properly as to the proper way to respond to, God forbid, there is uh, an issue like this in any of our public or even private schools in New Jersey. Um, that's very important. Knowledge is, is power. Um, and that way we can all work together. And I feel bad because we are putting more pressure on the teachers, but obviously they are there as protectors of our children for the you know six to seven, eight hours that they are in school every day. So yeah. it's important. 
Yeah, yeah, well, you bring up a good point. Have you been able to speak with educators because there is, you know, so much between uh, standardized testing uh, to what to do in case of, 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 an, uh, of a, a weather emergency to, uh, you know, violence in the schools. Um, are teachers getting overwhelmed? Do we need to see, like I live in an area uh, in uh, the South Hunterdon School District uh, where they had class three officers and then ultimately they decided, no, we don't want the class three officers in the school. I don't know if the opinion on that is gonna change now uh, considering some of the uh, recent uh, events in the news. Um, but is too much being put on, on the teachers? Um, I think in a way, yes, but they, again, are the people that are there with our children, you know, generally from eight to three, you know, ballpark times. Um, so I think it's important for them. I, also, I believe teachers get into that that uh, career because they want to, they care for children. They want to um, foster their growth education and, you know, help raise really good citizens of the world. Um, parents obviously have a bigger responsibility, but when I'm at work and my children, you know, are now grown, but if they were younger at school, I would depend on those teachers to be protectors um, in all capacities. You know, whether they're getting bullied on the playground versus, God forbid, again, this uh, horrible um, incident that might happen. Right, right. Well, um, and then do you think uh, we need more law enforcement with a presence at our schools? I think it adds comfort to the students, teachers, and parents who are dropping off to have a police presence there, whether it's that, um, you know, the level three police officer, um, or, mm -hmm. yes, I think that would be important, the SROs, mm -hmm. to again lend that um, mm -hmm. extra support, maybe put um, a police car out front to possibly prevent anybody from wanting to approach a school. Right. Right. Well, we thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us a little bit about uh, what your experience in the state legislature and also some of the initiatives that you support. And we thank you for taking the time to talk to us. Laura, thank you very much. It was a pleasure meeting you, and I you look forward to speaking with you again in the future. Hope to have you back on again. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Assemblyman Robert Karabenchek is a Democrat who serves in the New Jersey General Assembly, where he represents the 18th Legislative District, which covers parts of Middlesex County. Good to see you. Good to see you, Laura. Thanks so much for joining us. Now, you recently held a hearing on something called Wave Energy. So can you first briefly tell us what is Wave Energy? Well, Wave Energy is a, an alternative renewable energy source that we're looking to put in our master plan or energy master plan um everybody hears about wind and solar those are the two biggest energy sources that are clean energy however there are other energy sources and wave energy happens to be one of them there's wave energy that's along our coastline uh, along our jetties along our piers and there's two other types that are farther out in the ocean that are by buoys and uh, that are submersible. The waves never stop. The sun goes down at night. The winds slow down and pick up. Wave energy is always constant and is always there. So it's an energy source that I believe will adhere and be a supplement to both wind and solar. So it's the motion of the ocean. Yes. Now, you're going to be touring a wave energy facility, and you're going to learn more about this energy source. So where is this wave energy facility? We actually toured the Stevens Institute up in Hoboken. And during the hearings that we had in, in my committee, one of the presenters was from Stevens Institute. It was the Dr. Mahad Haj who's been involved in wave energy for, for many, many years. Um, in, in the Madison lab that's there, it's actually a, a, a facility that's 100 foot long, six foot deep, about 16 to 20 foot wide of water that they could create waves in and actually sense the energies that are below that water level and above the water level and it happens to to help in a lot of different ways that they could test it they can analyze it
they could figure out how the best process is to to deal with it in the construction side and the lifespans of it. Um, so it was extremely informative for me because I believe that this is going to be one of the uh, renewable sources that I'd like to see happen in New Jersey. Well, let's first talk a little bit how you hope or how they believe this could be beneficial to New Jersey, first of all, environmentally. Okay. Uh, on the environmental side, uh, we see little to no impact on the environmental side. Uh, the, the, the people that have seen it with the environmentalist uh, love the idea because it's renewable, clean energy that is just produced by movement. That's, that's the key. There's no other sources but that movement and brings it up and creates energy and then that energy could be put into the, our grid or it could be put into supplemental areas, whether it's a city, whether it's a pier, whether it's by a jetty um, to help that community and its energy sources. So there's multiple levels here that could be used in our 140 mile coastline that we have in New Jersey. We're the perfect spot. Uh, and I have to say, you know, the governor and, and, and DEP and everybody's involved and is looking at this along with BPU to put this and, and a few other major items of renewable energy onto that energy master plan. Because we're all looking forward to meeting our goals in, in, in 2030 and then 100% uh, by 2050. And I believe this is one of them that's going to help us get there. Well, could this benefit New Jersey economically? Could we see economic growth from this because it is the Jersey Shore? Oh, absolutely. Um, obviously, you know that we're building new plants, new manufacturing plants in South Jersey, one in Paulsboro, another one in Gloucester, and the third one, I can't remember the name. However, these are manufacturing plants that are going to be building wind turbines and the, and the actual structures for our, our wind farms that are going to go outside of Atlantic City and then uh, also north in, in, uh, by Perth Amboy. However, there's no other manufacturing like this along the East Coast. So we're hoping that this is gonna expand and other states will be able to use our manufacturing. This manufacturing plant could be expanded to, to also build these structures for wave energy. So we have everything that's in the process right now that no other state has that we could be able to utilize this. So it's good paying construction jobs, fabrication jobs, and then the jobs that are going to be produced in order to maintain all of these new markets is hasn't even been touched yet. We're talking about it. The, our, our education here is so good with all of our universities and colleges. And quite honestly, we lose a lot of those talent to other states. I believe this is going to keep that talent here. So I just right, see and, so many positive things. Sorry, Laura. I just right. see so many. Oh, yeah. And that's exactly where I was going about the creation of jobs because, yes. like you said, we have one of the best education, public education systems in, in the country. And yep. then students, I have a senior, uh, a, a new graduate. Uh, you know, people are, are leaving. And it's one thing to go away to college. But, you know, then to come back. So you're hopeful it's not going to just create, you know, it, it create those higher tech uh, and, and really u unique reasons to come back to New Jersey. Yes. Or to and, stay. Yes. And I, and I want them to stay because, you know, this, this transcends all different disciplines. You have skilled labor. You have uh, IT. You have engineers. You have support staffs. You have people that are going to be uh, driving our ships to to support and maintain the, the wind farms. You have helicopters pilots that are going to be bringing technicians to the wind ports. You have all the electrical side and, and all the maintenance that's going to happen on the solar side. These are things that haven't even started yet. So in my mind, this is enormous for New Jersey's economy. Yeah. And also for everybody looking for a job, people that are in college, people that are not in college. So this transcends, these are careers for people and good paying careers in New Jersey. Well, now there had been pushback on the idea of windmills off the coast of the Jersey Shore. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with that. So would this be an alternative? Could this be an alternative to that plan? Well, I truly believe in, in our wind farms. 
I had the opportunity to uh, visit Orsted in the, in the North Sea uh, about five years ago and saw their manufacturing, their wind farms down in the North Sea and their, and their technology and their control centers uh, you know, on land and what they produce. Um, we have addressed a lot of the concerns by a lot of the different stakeholders, whether it's the shipping, whether it's the fishing industry, uh, whether it's the environmentalists with uh, their concerns with, with birds and migration and such. Um, I believe we're addressing all of that with all of our rules and regulations that are being developed by the, uh, the different commissioners and BPO and, and so on. Um, yeah. Wave energy will, at its high point, can produce about 750 uh, megawatts uh, of power when it's fully operational. Right now, we're still in that 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 design energy state where we're, we're developing it and when how we're going to eventually uh, monopolize and bring it up to to full scale is something. Uh, I'm hoping that in in this year we could be uh, looking at doing some pilot programs at some of our uh, peers off of our New Jersey coast. Um, being able to analyze that, do the studies on it, make sure that we will be able to increase the size of that and how we're going to tie that in to supplement our energy grid. Um, yeah. So this is the first steps towards this. But the most important thing is, is to start talking about it and get people behind it. And this piece of clean energy, I'm 110 percent behind. I think one final question, those who live in our coastal communities, uh, tourism is such a, a, a driver of our economic uh, income in New Jersey. Would, is there a concern that there could be an eyesore, you know, that could lead to a pushback for those living in coastal communities? Yes, and we, we did, we did when, when we were talking about this during the, the commission, when we had people testify, I got some questions afterwards. Uh, what would it look like? Uh, will it protect the surfers? and will it protect swimmers? So the protection part is, is monumental. Every manufacturer and every person who's developing this technology is all in place looking to protect it. The people's most, most, most important. On the eyesore piece, I'm, I'm not talented enough, but the arts, we could have the color of it just blend into the ocean. We can make it a statement where we, it'll be a visual property that some artists can can create for that area so i'm confident that something will be addressed to make sure that those concerns for the public is, is addressed as long as it doesn't look like what was formerly xanadu the american dream that was an no. eyesore <laughs> that was an eyesore no, they didn't paint that place but <laughs> All right, but but that is that is a concern that people are expressing, and you are looking into that. All of the stakeholders are looking at that because that is a quality of life issue, correct? Absolutely. Yes. All right. Well, we thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us to explain a little bit more about wave energy, and it also sounds like that would be a fun field trip going up to the uh, institute for school students to look and see what a future career could be, uh, especially if they're interested in, um, in, in, in environmental issues and the mechanics of it. Like you said, it covers so many different disciplines. So thank you so much, Assemblyman. And thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. Governor Phil Murphy announced a property tax relief initiative where about 2 million families in New Jersey could see some temporary property tax relief. While visiting the South Brunswick Municipal Building, the governor announced an expansion of the property tax rebate program known as Anchor, which was unveiled in March. If approved by the legislature, homeowners with a household income of less than $150,000 would receive a $1,500 credit on their property tax bill each year. Our goal is to ensure that everyone willing to roll up their sleeves and work hard isn't just going to be able to get ahead in New Jersey, but will set their roots here. And I think making that happen takes two things. One is it takes strategic investments in what makes New Jersey so great to begin with and in what generates that opportunity. Investments in our nation-leading system of public education, investments in affordable housing, investments in workforce training, investments in health care accessibility, 
in strengthening child care, on and on. And two, it takes real and meaningful tax relief for hardworking families, those in our middle class and those striving to join their ranks. And in New Jersey, that tax relief starts by delivering upon past promises of lessening the impact of local property taxes. As it has been reported, state revenues have put us in a very strong fiscal position to do both of those steps. So today we are providing truly historic tax relief. We are keeping our promise to make New Jersey more affordable for our middle class and working families. Many have said it, but alongside the Senate President and the Speaker, we are doing it and their colleagues. I'm proud to stand alongside the, the Senate President and Speaker to announce the delivery of $2 billion in direct property tax relief to more than 2 million New Jersey households. Those with incomes between $150,000 and $250,000 would get a $1,000 credit, and renters with incomes of up to $150,000 would get $450 per year to help offset rent increases. And that will do it for today. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Laura Jones, and this is New Jersey Politics. We'll see you next time.